Now today I want you to take your Bible and turn with you please to Mark chapter 5 for the reading of God's Word today. I'd like for you to write in and get some of our cassette tape. Now the tape today will be tape number 164. 164. I'm speaking on this subject. Two fools in a graveyard, naked man, dead hogs, and no hot water. That's my subject for today. Two fools in a graveyard, a naked man, dead hogs, and no hot water. That'll be tape number 164. Now you can write in and get some of our cassette tape. We have quite a few listed. In fact, I have 160 listed here. I have in my hand 160 cassette tape. They're good to use in your home. You can take them to convalescent homes, hospitals, prisons, jails, and whatnot. And they can be a blessing. It's a great ministry. There's a lot of precious shut in people that like to hear singing and preaching on cassette tape. And if you would take them a tape, you have a tape recorder, and just sit down and listen with them. It'd be a blessing to a lot of precious elderly people. They'd look forward to it. Many of you maybe don't have a tape player if you get you one. Maybe some of you younger people thinking about your mother and father in time of birthdays and special occasions and whatnot, Father's Day, Mother's Day. If they don't have a tape recorder, then you ought to try to get them one. There's a lot of good singing and preaching today that can be placed on cassette tape that can be a real blessing to them. We have many, many cassette tapes that can be a real blessing to you. And they'll be available. We send them out for a gift of $3 for each tape. And the gift is used to help pay for radio time and other expense. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I do hope you're finding the place now in Mark chapter 5. I want you to turn there in your Bible. It's page 1050. In the original Schofield Reference Bible, I was reading just the other day in a little magazine about this fellow riding along the highway, and he came very tired and very sleepy. He thought, I better stop by the roadside and rest for just a short while and get me a little nap, and then I can move on down the highway. So he stopped beside the road and just about ready to doze off to sleep. After about 15 minutes, here come a jogger along, and Bang, bang on the glass there, the wind of his automobile. And he raised up to see what he wanted. The jogger said, hey, could you tell me what time it is, fella? He said, yes, it's uh, 8.15. He thanked him and he went on his way. He's about ready to doze off sleep again. Here come another jogger. He tapped on the window and the man raised up. said, fella, what do you want? He said, could you tell me what time it is? He said, Man said, yes, it's 8.15. He thought, well, if I get in a rest, I got to do something about it. So he just wrote on a little piece of paper and hanged out on the outside of the glass. And, and they put on there, said, uh, I don't have the time. And then he about ready to doze off sleep again. And here come another jogger along. And he tapped on the glass. And the man said, what do you want? He said, the time is... Uh, 15 till 9 say so you don't have the time so he was having some problems a lot of times you have problems like that Mark chapter 5 beginning with verse 1 and they came over unto the side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship immediately they met him out of the tombs of man with an unclean spirit who had his dwellings among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. 
For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. And there was there nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us unto the swine that we may enter, unto the, enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000. And they were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the country. And they went out to see what, it, what had been done. Now I want to read another verse to a scripture connected with the same story. Matthew chapter 8 verse 28. And when he was come into the other side into the country of the Gersonese, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. And then in Luke chapter 8 in verses 26 and 27. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time. And wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Now if you will notice the scriptures I've given you from Mark chapter 5, from Matthew chapter 8 verse 28, from Luke chapter 8 verses 26 and 27, that will justify my subject. Two fools in a graveyard milling around out there. And then a man here with no clothes on, a naked man. And then these hogs ran into the Sea of Galilee and drowned themselves. So you have the dead hogs. And I've been on the Sea of Galilee many times and the water is cold so there's no hot water. So you have two fools in the graveyard, naked man, dead hogs and no hot water. Tape number 164. And I hope it'll be a blessing to you today. Write in and get the tape. Now there's several things I want to call your attention to about this particular narrative. Number one, this man had his dwelling among the tombs in verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now this man here could not be tamed, he could not be bound, he could not be enclosed and held. He was a strong man, demon possessed. And if they put chains on him, he'd break them asunder and go on about his business. He wandered around out of the graveyard. He was demon possessed and he left to live out among the dead people out in the graveyard. I read the story one time of this beer joint not very far from a cemetery. And about midnight one night, one of the fellows about drunk left the beer joint and on the way home and he thought he would travel through the cemetery and get home a little quicker and he's going through the cemetery and came by an open grave. Some other drunk had gone on before he had and had fallen in that drunken grave, or that, in that empty grave, and he was down in the grave, and he was hollering and saying, I'm, I'm cold, I'm cold. And the old drunk said, no wonder you're cold, you fool, you done kicked all the dirt off of you. And so he went on about his business, wasn't long until another drunk came by, and this fellow done shut up. He's about froze to death. He crawled over in the corner of the grave and thought he'd try to get it. Now we find here that this man here had his dwelling among the tombs. And he loved it out there in the graveyard. You know, a lot of people like to mill around in a cemetery. You have demon-possessed people like to go out and destroy cemeteries and turn over tombstones and things of that type. And that's bad. Now a tomb speaks of a desolate place. It speaks of the dead. It speaks of a desolate place. In Job chapter 3 verses 13 and 14. For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then I'd been at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth. Which built desolate places for themselves. So we know then that the tomb of the grave speaks of death. It speaks of a desolate place. And it speaks of pollution. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 19 and verse 16. 
And whosoever touched one that is slain with a sword in the open field or a dead body, a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. So we know the cemetery, the graveyard, speaks then of pollution. Not only that, it speaks of death. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sins. So we know it speaks of death. And our first point today is to point out the picture of a lost sinner. Now uh, you may say, now preach Edwards, I just don't like the kind of picture there that you gave of a lost sinner. I could give you, give you something worse than that in the Bible. But I won't have time to do it today. But this is a picture of a man without God, a lost sinner in a desolate place, in darkness, among the dead, dead in trespass and sins. And you have that picture here in this narrative. Then secondly, I want you to notice he was uncontrollable. And verses 3 and 4, now remember I'm basing my text on uh, Mark chapter 5. And verses 3 and 4, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because it had he been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now, no man can tame him. Now, there's some things you can tame in this world to a certain extent. But no man could handle this demon-possessed man. You could not uh, tame him in any manner. Dr. Doobetter could not handle this case. You could call in old Dr. Doobetter and say, Now, look, listen, Dr. Doobetter. I want you to do something for this wild man. He's untamable. And you being a doctor, I want you to see if you can't Make him do a little better than he's been doing. Well, Dr. Doobetter couldn't handle this case. Medical science could not handle this case either. You could have brought in all kind of medication. And they'd give a man maybe a, a pill every hour, a dose of medicine every 30 minutes. And you still couldn't have handled this man. This was a man that was untamable, uncontrollable. You could not handle him. There's a reason for that. Education could not have handled this fellow at all. You could have sent this man to school and let him go to school every day and let him graduate, get a diploma. Now, while he was going to school, he might have gone out and stole your cats and dogs, but whenever he got his degree, he'd rob your bank. There's something wrong with this man here that education could not straighten out. Now, we have fought good, good education, good sanctified, the right kind of education. We gotta have it, we must have it. We're for it 100%. But you don't educate people to God. That heart has to be changed. Man is rotten on the inside. He's gotta be changed from within. Education can't do that job. It can educate the mind, but that heart is still evil. Someone said, well, I know what we'll do. We'll ameliorate the uh, conditions around him and see if we can't tear down the slums and." do away with them and build him a new house and get him in a fine warm home and get him some nice funny tour and that'll take care of him. Get him some better clothes, buy him a TV set and a radio and we'll fix the man up. No, that wouldn't have changed this man. There's something wrong with this fellow on the inside. He had to be changed from within. Better conditions could not help him. You have a lot of people today, bless your heart, they were born and reared out in the gutter, and that's where they want to stay. You can take the uh, money from the federal government. You can build new apartments. You can put rugs on the floor, wallpaper the walls, and make them as beautiful as you can find anywhere. Move this family in and go back and pay them a visit in about a month, and the place looks like a hog pen. Beloved, that won't do the job. Something has to be done on the inside. Here this past week, some people from across town on the east side of Athens, I know the house number, came out here at the end of my driveway and dumped a pile of garbage and trash out there. And I went down and checked it and found out the house number it came from. And I called the policeman and got him to check it and he's checking on the situation and probably going to do something about it, I hope. 
But the story goes back like many months ago when they was calling in to WNGC when they had such program and people were complaining about trash being thrown on the road and litter and garbage all up and down the road and somebody called in with the correct answer. They said the only way you'll keep that litter from off of the road and beside the road is keep the trash from driving on the road. And that's it. When you have trash driving from one side of town to the other to dump out the garbage, then you got to change them from the inside and get them straightened out and teach them a lesson. Uh, they'll take the garbage next time over on the west side of town and dump it out on the north side. It's pathetic. People drive up and down the roads and throw out their litter, their garbage, and you drive up and down the streets and it looks terrible. It's a disgrace to the city of Athens, Georgia to see some of these roads. If you don't believe it, you go out here on Boley Drive and come in from Commerce Road and drive out Boley Drive on down Freeman Drive and look at the litter on, on the side of the road. You see what I'm talking about. It's a shame and it's a disgrace. And people have no respect for themselves and they dump it out on the highways. If you'd visit their homes and their yards, You'd find the same kind of stuff in their yards and the same kind of trash in their homes. That's the kind of people they are. They need to get right with God and you're welcome. If you don't like it, you can leap it, lump it, leave it, or jump over to whatever you want to do. Amen. It's the truth anyhow. Now here's a man here. Well, you couldn't have straightened this man out. You can give him better conditions. But he needed a doctor to help him that could help him. And the doctor that could come to his rescue would be Dr. Jesus. Now, Dr. Jesus came on the scene, and Dr. Jesus uh, straightened the man out. Now, the only way you're going to straighten out some people is get Dr. Jesus a hold of them and healed up. Let's move on to thought number three. I won't get my message on today if I don't move along um, faster than I'm moving along. Number three, he had unusual power. Now, where did this man get this unusual power? Well, the Bible says in Mark chapter 5 and verse 4, Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Here's a man who just take these big old chains and snap them apart. Now, where did he get that power? He obtained that power from the devil. That's demon power. Now, during the tribulation period, when the church is removed from the earth and the Antichrist takes over and the devil's let loose on the earth, these prisons are not going to hold these criminals. They'll tear those iron bars off those windows and walk out and they'll walk free up on the earth. They'll do it through demon power during the tribulation period. And Luke chapter 8 and verse 29, and he break the bands and was driven the devil into the wilderness. The devil just marched him around and he did what the devil wanted him to do. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28, exceeding fear so that no man might pass by that way. While the people were afraid to come by the cemetery. While this man could have killed them or damaged them in some way and they were afraid to go by that cemetery. And you can understand why. Now why is it today we have these terrible, hideous crimes committed? People mutilate bodies. People take a knife and cut a man's head off and throw it in his body. Cut his uh, limbs off, throw them in the back of an automobile and do things like that and then torment people when they're putting them to death. What makes people do that? One answer. The same thing that made this man do what he was doing, demon possessed. Yeah. Those people are demon possessed. Now you could take those fellows out and Give them a little, try to give them a little education, try to train them, and try to teach them how to do better. But you're absolutely wasting your time. The only way you can handle people like that is get their hearts, number one, right with God. Get them saved. Get them saved. Then you'd have some hope or some chance of helping them further, but not until then. Now, you can talk about educating these criminals and things of that type, these cold-blooded murderers. It'll never be done. Never. You got to get their hearts right. You get their hearts right, get them saved. You might be able to help them. But you're not going to get very many of them saved. They're demon possessed. They're going to hell. They're not going to get saved. Once in a while, you might reach one for God. This man had unusual power that came from demonism. 
Let's move on to thought number four. Jesus was the only one that could deliver him. Look at verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now the voice of God says, Do thyself no harm. The voice of Satan said, Do all the harm you can. Jesus saw the man, and Jesus said, Come out of him. And those demons had to come out. Now when those demons came out of the man, he was a different feller. He was altogether different. He was a new man. Now I've seen drunkards, I've seen people drunk and so ungodly and so mean. They'd get drunk and beat up their families, whip their wives, whip their children, tap their funny to them, mean as the devil wanted them to be. Just poor old sot drunkards, throw the money away, live like the devil, curse every breath. I've seen a few of those people change, but uh, God had to change them. You had to get them saved. Unless you get them saved, they'll never change. They'll be like that, and they will continue to get worse. Oh, somebody said, what we need now is a little more money from Washington. Build a few more uh, nice apartments and hand out a little more uh, money and gifts to the people and and uh, encourage him a little bit, and, and then you'll, everything will be all right. No, no, it won't. It'll get worse all the time. Now I know what I'm talking about. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until they get their hearts changed. If you ever get them saved, that will be the difference, but there'll be no difference until you get them saved. You better believe that. There are devils at heart. There are thieves at heart. There are murders at heart. They're demon-possessed. They can dress up and look like a Philadelphia lawyer and be as mean as hell itself on the inside, just waiting to kill somebody, rob, or steal because their hearts are not right with God. Number five, he had enough demons in him to run 2,000 hogs crazy. Now, I want you to let that sink deep down into your ears. The Bible said this man had enough demons in him to run these hogs crazy. And verse 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now here you find a man had enough demons in him to cause 2,000 hogs to go crazy as a fly and jump in the Sea of Galilee and drown themselves. I've been there. I've ridden on the Sea of Galilee. I've been to the place where these hogs jumped into the water and they drowned themselves in the Sea of Galilee. And this man had enough demons in him to cause these 2,000 hogs to run into the Sea of Galilee and drown themselves. A demon is a powerful creature, and you better believe it. And we have people demon-possessed today. And the only way they can be delivered is through the power of God Almighty. Now, this man just loved the graveyard. He'd walk around in the graveyard and no doubt make all kind of hideous noises and screams and cries. And they're walking around in the grave and yelling at night and keeping people awake and sitting around on the tombstones and scratching around in the graves all night long. He loved that. That was home to him. He loved it very much. I saw a man the other day, I see him occasionally, walking up and down the highway with a sack in his hand, picking up trash. At least he's doing that much. But really what he's trying to do is find some beer cans so he can sell them probably and Get him whatever he wants, and he picks up the beer cans. At least does that much good. But sometimes he's just so dirty and nasty and filthy, you can't tell what color the man is. I asked someone, I said, where in the world does that man live? Look like he might have some water somewhere nearby. And they said, you know that man lives in a, a pasteboard box over in the woods? That's what somebody told me. I don't know. I'm just telling you what they told me. Said he lives in a pasteboard box over in the woods. And of course, I know he doesn't live anywhere near a creek or a branch. Did he might accidentally fall in it, wash a little of that filth off. But he lives over in the creek of the woods and, and he gets out and travels up and down the road and picks up all the 
junk he can that he can trade or maybe find something somebody throwed out that didn't eat it all and probably eat part of it. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. And that man needs God. If he'd get Jesus Christ in his heart and get cleaned up and get him a decent place to live. I used to say years ago, I've changed my mind now. You know you have to change your mind once in a while because things change. I used to say years ago in my preaching, to go uh, with your hands and face dirty and your body dirty, you have no excuse for doing it because you can go to the store and buy a cake of soap and plenty of water around you and wash. But I don't want you to buy a cake of soap now or not. You know, it's high. You go in and buy a cake of soap now, you got to have some money to buy it with. Because a cake of soap now costs you something or another. But back a few years ago, you could get a bar of soap for about a nickel. And no excuse for people being dirty and nasty. But anyway, God gets on the inside and God straightens the heart out. And then the outside takes care of itself. And these hogs drown themselves, the Bible tells us. Now you may say, preach Edwards, why did Jesus permit these demons to go into these hogs when the hogs belonged to someone else and then they drowned in the Sea of Galilee? You got to remember this, a bunch of bootleggers. These bootleggers over there were bootlegging those hogs. Now, a Jew wasn't supposed to be raising hogs. Abomination to a Jew, but they'd go over there and bootleg these hogs and raise them and sell them. It's unlawful for them to do so. And so they were bootleggers. They lost their hogs because it was unlawful for them to have them. Now, somebody went in and broke up somebody's liquor still and poured out his whiskey and all that kind of stuff. You, I wouldn't fuss too much about that. He, so we're breaking the law anyway. Shouldn't be making the stuff and selling it. But anyway, these were bootleggers and they lost their business when the demons went into those hogs and went down and drowned. Enough demons to run these hogs crazy. Number six, notice this man after he met Jesus. In verse 15, they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Now here is a man, the Bible said he had met the Lord Jesus, and now since he had met Jesus, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Not only that, he put some clothes on. Now, a lot of times now you see people on the street or you turn on a TV set, and some people got about enough clothes on to make a, a pair of suspenders for a half-grown mosquito, and you wonder about them. Now, the Bible said when this man got right with God, he put on some clothes. Amen. And God expects his people to wear some clothes. Amen. Amen. God told Adam and Eve to put some clothes on. Right. And from that time until now, God means the people wear clothes. Not go around naked. These nudist camps, they're full of demons. You know, these nudist camps where the men and women meet and don't wear clothes, that's a demon camp. They're full of demons. They go there because a demon possess, and uh, if he cast the demons out of them, they put some clothes on. Now, a lot of people, if they had get, get, get the demons out of them, get right with God, did wear some clothes. Right. And so we find here that this man was sitting there in his right mind, clothed, in his right mind. Now, the devil had this man warped, and the devil has a lot of people warped today. That's why they act like they do. That's why they spend all the money for liquor and to gamble and cuss and lie and steal and live like the devil. The devil's got their minds warped. If they ever get straightened out and get their minds straightened out, it'd be a different story. Now, this man is now in his right mind. While well, you couldn't drive him out there in that graveyard, now he's been changed. Now, when people get changed by the power of God, there's a lot of difference. I don't go back to the same places I used to go before God saved me. No, sir. You couldn't force me back there unless I went there to preach. You may say, preach, Edwards, you go to the movie and picture show. No, they won't let me preach. If they let me go in there and preach, I'd go. But since they won't let me preach, I'm not going. I'm not going out there and buy a ticket to keep up that bunch of adulterers and, and uh, harlots and drunks and dope addicts out in Hollywood. No, sir, I don't go there. And so he's in his right mind, and he wanted to stay with Jesus. Verse 18, And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. 
Here is a man when he got saved, and I want this to sink deep down into your ears. When this man got saved, he wanted to be with Jesus. And I believe with all my heart when a person really gets a good dose of old time Holy Ghost salvation, he lusts to go to the house of God. If you have to be forced to drag, to pull, to beg, to plead it with to come to the house of God, you need to go back and get you another dip. And I'm not talking about brute and snuff. I'm talking about get a good dose of salvation and, and get baptized again. Might help you. But if you're saved, you have a desire to come to the house of God and enjoy the things of God unless you're backslidden and cold indifferent and so cold indifferent until you forgot you were even saved. You shouldn't do that. You should have a desire to be in the house of God. And so he wanted to be with Jesus. Now what did Jesus tell him to do? Jesus said to him in verse 19, How be it Jesus said to him not, but said to him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord's done for thee and had compassion on thee. Go home, he said, to your friends secondly, and then tell about the love of God. Now your first place, your starting point when you get saved is your own home. Start in your own home. Tell your wife, your youngins, your children, grandma, grandpa, your cousins, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins of the dozens, in-laws and outlaws. Tell them all about Jesus. Start at home. And then after you start at home, then start telling your friends about it. That's what Jesus said for him, dude. That's what he did. He told about the love of God. Then finally, the people begged Jesus to leave their town. They said, that man, Jesus Christ, He's come over here and he's had our hogs drowned and he's broken up our bootlegging business and, and I want him to get out of this town and never come back again. You know, this world hates the Lord. This world hates Jesus. The devil's outfit hates the Lord. They don't want him around. In verse 17, and they begin to pray him to depart out of their coast. Finally, he left them and said, all right, if that's what you want. And that was a sad hour when he left. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 34, And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. The whole town came out. Everybody said, Jesus Christ, get out of our town. We don't want you here. And the average home today doesn't want God. The average town today doesn't want God. The average business place today doesn't want God. The average human being today doesn't want God. And God's not going to push himself on anyone. God loves you. He loves your soul. He hates your sins. And God will save you. But God's not going to push himself on you. He says, you come now and I'll save you. I died for you. I paid the sin debt. If you'll come to me, I'll love you. I'll save you. But if you don't want to, I'm not going to force myself on you. And God let you die and go to hell before he forces himself on you. And you don't have to die and go to hell. You can be saved. I hope somebody today will get right with God. I brought the message God laid on my heart. I'm trusting God will use it. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you'll use this message, that you'll speak to hearts. We know what the power of God can do. We know what it did here. We pray that somebody out in the radio listen audience will get right with God. Somebody in this building, I pray. In Christ's lovely name, amen. Debbie's going to play for us on the organ as she plays. Now, you listen to me very closely. I'm going to let you go in a moment or so. If you're in this building and you're not saved and you want to get saved, you can get saved. God loves you. He hates your sins. He might not like your ways, but he loves your soul. If you're here, you're backslidden on God and you want to come back into fellowship, God will take you back like the father took the prodigal son back. If you're here and you're looking for a church home and you feel like Northside is the place that God wants you, if you want to come down here as we receive members, you may come and we'll take that in consideration. While we wait, is God speaking, would you come? How about it today? giving you the message we're giving you ample time to respond now there's
responsibility is on your shoulders. Play through the stanza one more time, Debbie. If nobody comes, we're going. 